Hey guys, Mark Holthy here, Canadian immigration lawyer, and I am super excited to have my good friend uh, Kyle Heineman join me, which I will pull him in in just a little bit here for this. Really, it's it's quite a special little broadcast, I guess you could say. To a large extent, oh. I've done this format via podcast, but I've never had enough guts to actually try it here uh, in a live video where I am the tech guy. I'm kind of the co presenter, but fortunately I've got Kyle here who I'm going to jump to in a few seconds as we uh, welcome other people in here. Um, there's going to be a, a few other uh, uh, a few other things that he's going to be able to cover that are going to help to, to support me as I navigate through this. So we'll get to uh, Kyle's introductions in a little bit, but I want to give a shout out to everybody that's tuning in. We've got Angie from Algeria. Uh, we've got Raul here who's in Panapat, India. Welcome, Raul. We've got Bella, who is the greatest of all time supporter. Thanks for joining in, Bella. Excellent. So we've got a good group of people that are kind of tuning in. And, and boy, this one is one that's going to be useful for a lot of people. And um, we're going to go through some of the, um, the travel restrictions, including this secret document that the border officers, and I shouldn't really make it sound so mysterious, but it really was. They were using this document to guide their decision making with entry. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, but yeah, this is going to be good. So if you've got specific questions that you have regarding whether or not you can actually travel to Canada or your family, this is the one for you. And as you've seen, I tend to be a lot of uh, form, you know, with the video and stuff like that. But Mr. Kyle Heinemann, who's joining me, is going to bring in the substance. Okay, let's see. We've got Ben, North Dakota. Uh, we've got Jessica tuning in from Scarborough. Welcome, Jessica. And uh, Hussein here saying, hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, my friend. All right. Without further ado, let's jump over to uh, to my guest, Kyle Heinemann and myself. How are you doing, Kyle? Hey, Mark. Doing great. Uh, great to see you. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Awesome. So we've got our, we both have our fancy backgrounds here that I've selected and uh, kind of flipped them around. So it looks like we're in the same office, which is kind of cool. But uh, Kyle is an immigration lawyer practicing in the beautiful city of Vancouver. And uh, he is um, on the national executive of the Canadian Bar Association with me. So that's where we get to rub shoulders quite frequently. But just a disclaimer, this is not anything related to the Canadian Bar Association. <laughs> and even though we are on the national executive, these are our own comments, our own thoughts, and this is entirely uh, separated from that. So no connection. We are speaking in our personal capacities and, uh, you know, to some extent, um, I guess, as Canadian immigration lawyers. So, Kyle, how are things out in Vancouver? Oh, brilliant. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny day. Sun is shining. It's warm. Um, of course, we're all sort of on lockdown, but we can enjoy the mountains from a distance. Yeah. That's that's awesome. I know we've been just dying. And now that the war is, you know, it's warm out, we finally can get out of our houses and out of these cocoons that we've been hibernating in a little bit. Um, but it's still we got a long ways to go. And uh, sure. when we're when we're looking at these travel restrictions and the fact that, you know, any anyone who's looking to come, you know, for a holiday to Canada, just like us to many other countries, it just ain't happening. So. Um, right. Yeah. So those of you who are tuning in, I just wanted to let you know that we're going to have a little bit more of a substantive discussion today. We're going to look at some of the, the source documents that are driving the entry of individuals into Canada, who can come, who can't. In particular, this uh, this um, shift briefing bulletin from the Canada Border Service Agency, which I hinted at last week um, when it was first released, but I didn't get into any detail because I knew I wanted to bring Kyle on. And there was some haters out there on the YouTube that were like, he's not saying anything. He's just hoarding it to himself. Well, not only did I delete them from the group and block them, but um, I do want to say that we actually are going to get into it in detail. And I was almost a little reluctant too to, to release it because I was afraid, is this really something that we can talk about? But Public domain, open season now, and I'm sure the CBSA will basically toss it out the window and say, we don't follow that anymore anyways. But it still is a good guideline to help us know what's going on in the heads and the minds of those officers. Uh, what do you think, Kyle? Is that a pretty good <laughs> description? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, just to give a bit more background, um, the orders in council that, that Mark is talking about are, are the law that kind of underlays all of this. Um, it, orders in council are a weird kind of legal instrument that's 
just made by cabinet instead of being passed through parliament, but they have the force of law. This secret memo that Mark's talking about is not law, but it's the policy guidance that border officers use to interpret the law. So it's pretty important because regardless of what the law says, what really matters is what's happening on the ground. And this memo gives us a lot of insight into what officers are doing on the ground. And it's true that it was secret for a long time. And so it was really difficult for us to give advice to people about whether they could come in or not. And now we have a, a, an insight into how officers are making those decisions. Yep. Um, and, and this memo only came out because uh, somebody actually sued the government and, <laughs> and it was disclosed as part of a court case. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so it wasn't it, it sort of pried from their <laughs> their their hands. Uh, but anyway, it's public now and uh, we're going to we're going to explore it and, and mm -hmm. hopefully uncover some of the interesting little tidbits in there. Yes. And I'm just as Kyle's talking here, of course, with the tech side, I'm going to be doing some things and we may not get this perfectly right, but that's OK. Um, we were limited in our ability to actually pull information out in a way that made it really easy for people to see. So this is pretty much the best that we're going to get. Now, I know there is a view and I was able to find it last night, but I'm not going to waste time trying to find it. So ignore all the other icons and everything around here. This is the shift briefing bulletin that we're going to talk about. And it was originally designed to address U.S. entry. So people who are coming from the U.S. Um, and obviously when I think we're looking at about what 95 or I should say probably I'll just jump back to our view here when we were when we're looking at a cut in probably 97 percent of airline traffic to Canada obviously the the main issues the border officers are dealing with are land crossings from the US so that's where this document was originated from and um, and but with that being said, the, the the thought process and the um, you know the direction that's been given the officers in the context of a U.S. entry has a pretty good chance of being applied in that same thought process to individuals who are actually flying in. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Mark. Um, and this this bulletin relates to the order and council that's specifically for people coming from the U.S. But it, as Mark said, the philosophy is is going to be the same. The way they interpret what's essential and non-essential travel is going to be very, very similar for, for both. You bet. And what I'm going to do here, we've got a bunch of uh, these these orders in council that I wanted to share with everyone. And these are the documents. These are, these are what's flowing from the Quarantine Act, these orders in council that are providing uh, those who are trying to administer entry of people into Canada. <clears throat> this is the basis, <clears throat> excuse me, of them. And so you can see this order in council specifically relates to entry from the United States. So this bulletin that Kyle, I'm going to flip back to the bulletin again. This is kind of where this bulletin came from. So it's helping the officers to, to make sense and understand what is going on with the actual um, these orders that were being released. And there was not a lot of opportunity for them to, you know, to get together and talk about, you know, how these should be interpreted. So the bulletin is really been the tool that they've used to try to guide them. Now, I know some boarders have just said, we're just not letting anybody in. And I won't say who those are, but, um, you know, some port of, ports of entry. But generally, this is this is the direction, right? This is where we're going. And a bit of a, a disclaimer here is that both Mark and I in previous lives worked for the border services. So we have some insight to the challenges that officers are facing. And, and you know, we've heard that they've got so many different uh, bulletins and program delivery updates and orders and other guidance bulletins um, that it's difficult for them to follow. Sometimes it's like several a day and they're trying to update their practices in real time. So it's really challenging for them. And, and that's why this, as Mark said, this bulletin has been really helpful because it kind of puts a lot of this guidance into one place. Yes, exactly. And, you know, Kyle really hit on one thing. I want to, although you know, in some cases, we're going to be maybe a little critical of, uh, you know, as we get into the bulletin, we might be a little critical. But both of both of us come from a position of we know where they're at. We know what they're going through. And it's more of, of, of compassion, I guess, to some extent. Although some of my other colleagues, like a podcast that I'm going to be doing tomorrow, will probably have a different spin to it. But this one definitely... You know, we're, we're, we, we're grateful for the CBSA. We're grateful for the work that they do. Um, we're, just, we're just frustrated they never released this darn document to us uh, earlier because now we can actually step in and tell our clients, hey, this is what they're looking at, so you probably are not going to get in because this is how an officer is being instructed to deal with your situation. So, all right. So what we have here is uh, Kyle and I, <clears throat> we've, we've just 
we thought we'd just give a very high level of some of the general overviews as to different classes of people and their entry to Canada. And um, and just we're not going to dive in really deep down into these orders in council. Um, but maybe I'll just shift back here to the web and I'll just give people a very high overview of, of what we're looking at. So we'll provide links to all of these in the description after this so that you can find them. These are temporary documents. You can see this one just for the US was just extended on May the 21st. And this is this is where the information come from. So who can come in, who can't, <clears throat> and then they all have expiry dates. So this one is valid until June 21st and we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll extend it. Maybe they'll make some changes, but that's kind of how it's structured. So there's one for US. Then there's one for individuals that are any other country other than the US. And like we said, with 97% of airline traffic, you know, being reduced, um, the number of volumes of people that are actually seeking to come are pretty low. Then we just want to bring your attention to this, but we're not going to dive in and cover this with any significant amount of detail. Um, and that's basically the mandatory isolation number two. This this uh, order in council um, under Section 58 of the Quarantine Act basically uh, gives instruction of what people need to do to isolate themselves, quarantine themselves when they come into Canada. And, uh, and also being able to show uh, to the officers that they have a plan for keeping Canadians and, and those in Canada safe uh, just while we're in the midst of this pandemic. So um, I don't know, Kyle, if you have any high level stuff in terms of this isolation that we know people must be aware of. Um, yeah, not too much to add, Mark, other than the basic premises that everybody has to quarantine unless you fit into one of the narrow exceptions in the order. So um, when we're going through the list of who can and cannot come in, for the most part, even the people we say can come in are going to be subject to this mandatory isolation rule um, with some pretty narrow exceptions. Yeah, exactly. All right, great. OK, I'm going to shift back here and we're going to just take a look at a couple other resources that I want to point out to you. So one is this, and you can just Google it, how the coronavirus disease is affecting immigration. That is probably, at least from a layman's standpoint, uh, the, the, the most important link that you could go to figure out what's happening with processing, what's happening with, um, you know, just where things are at with uh, the immigration and their, um, this world of COVID-19 that we're in. And then also for those of you who want to dive in a little bit deeper, this is the program delivery instructions that the officers follow, and they're actually pretty good. So initially it was a little bit rough and tumble. It took some time for them to kind of get things sorted out a little bit. And I think Kyle can attest the, uh, you know, the program delivery instructions weren't always in sync with the orders in council and how people are trying to interpret this in ways that people can understand. Sometimes the wording terminology didn't, um, didn't help to clarify things as, as well as they hoped, but created more confusion. Yeah, I mean, things happened really fast, as we all know, and government had to react very quickly. And so bringing in the orders and then trying to roll out detailed instructions to thousands of border officers and inland processing officers is a big job. And, and it happened really quickly. And of course, there were some hiccups along the way. Yeah. And we so understand once again, Kyle and I, we have tremendous compassion for those officers and what they're trying to do. And we know that sometimes they had to make some really, really harsh, harsh decisions and ones that we don't necessarily agree with and we feel like there's other ways that maybe things could be handled. But hey, let's face it, they're just doing what they can to try to uh, to navigate through this these uncharted waters. Okay, so what I wanna start out with is um, we're gonna have Kyle start with a little discussion over some of the general rules when it comes to citizens, permanent residents, and status Indians with respect to any travel restrictions that may apply to them or may not. Sure, and, and this is a pretty short one. The, the short answer is that Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and people who are registered as Indians under the Indian Act all have a right to enter Canada. And that right is not changed by any of these orders of the Quarantine Act or anything else. They have a right to come into Canada. They probably will need to self-isolate depending on the circumstances, but they can come into Canada no matter what. Perfect. OK, that's pretty easy. OK, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift over here and uh, just address workers for a little bit. Now, understand um, there's things that we understand and know about the orders in council, about the program delivery instructions, about all of this that may or not be, a, be may or may not be um, uh, applied necessarily equally across all ports of entry. So when you think about the U.S. and you're coming from the U.S., which is a lot of the, the traffic that we're dealing with, 
Um, a lot of it comes down to this whole concept, and Kyle will talk about this as well, whether we're talking about students or visitors or whatever, um, something called uh, uh, non-optional or non-discretionary entry. And built into the Orders in Council, this is kind of like a, an overlay over everything else. Is the purpose of your coming to Canada, is, do you really have to come right now? Is there something about it um, that just makes it really, really necessary as opposed to something that is just discretionary? And uh, there's been a lot of confusion over whether non-optional, um, non-discretionary is, is also mixed in with whether it's essential travel. And you'll see in the border uh, directives that they kind of interchange that terminology a lot. So they'll often say, well, is it essential? Well, we also have another complicating factor, which is what's happening in Canada within each of the provinces and these lists of industries that are deemed essential. And so sometimes people say, okay, well, the construction industry and what we're doing here is it's on the you know, essential list so we can keep our businesses open. Well, that is not to be confused with what the border officers are looking at um, in terms of an entry that is really essential. So keep that in mind a little bit as we're talking about this. But generally speaking, from the U.S. standpoint, aside from being able to establish that, um, you know, that your purpose of your entry is non-optional or non-discretionary, it should be business as usual. In other words, can a, uh, U.S. citizens coming in should be able to um, obtain a work permit at the port of entry if they fit into one of these these categories. And and when I say categories, I probably sh I'm, I'm I'm probably muddying the waters a little bit. If it can be shown that things like there, there's still a business in operation, you know, that there's a reason for you to come in. And, um, and so, you know, from the standpoint of being able to actually make the application for a work permit, that should be possible for individuals coming from the U.S. We are hearing things on the ground, though, that individuals at times when they're coming in, let's say, to apply for a NAFTA based work permit to work in, you know, one of these essential services that is is being allowed to operate in Canada, that that these individuals at times are being uh, refused, refused boarding on airlines. And although Kyle and I haven't had any experiences ourselves, our colleagues across the country have experienced that. So to a large extent, it's, it's you know, all of the, the rules related to applying for work permits are still, you know, there isn't any added level on top of them with respect to qualifying under the immigration rules and, um, and eligibility, you know, assessment that's done by immigration. Um, so that's from the U.S. standpoint. Kyle, did you have anything that you wanted to add on to uh, the, the basically the more open nature of, of people coming from uh, U.S. citizens coming from the U.S.? Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I think we'll we'll get into some more of the details yeah. when we go through the examples in the memo, and that's really where the the interesting stuff comes in is is the examples that they've chosen and the examples that they haven't chosen. Yes, perfect. Okay, then we take a, a, a snapshot of what's happening overseas, and so when you're coming in from a country um, anywhere other than the U.S., it's it's actually the opposite. So instead of having from the US yes it's okay you can come in subject to these you know meeting these requirements it's the it's the flip side for the orders in council that relate to those who are not uh, US in the US and so um, the general rule is that if you're you know unless you're a, a Canadian citizen like Kyle said you know a permanent resident or uh, an Indian under the Indian Act you you basically you can't come unless you fit into one of the exemptions and there's a whole list of those exemptions. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go into a, a big, big, long, drawn out explanation, but March 18th is kind of the day that we look at to a large extent for, for many of the other individuals that are coming in. But for workers to be able to board the plane, they ask a question, do you have a work permit? Okay, do you have a valid work permit? Or if you don't have a valid one, have you already applied? And we know that those applications have to be made online. So no longer can someone overseas who may have been, you know, able to travel on an ETA and apply it at a port of entry. That's not possible now. They actually have to make those applications through a foreign consulate. Well, it's online. And uh, and so those are really the two pillars for, for workers. Now, we, we'll get into a little bit of a discussion about um, individuals who are exempt from the need for a work permit. But that letter, to a large extent, will um, uh, fill that void to allow them to have something to show the airline that yes, I can board. So if you have a work permit right now, 
or if your work permit application you, you've applied for and it's been approved, um, those are two of the key pillars to be able to come as a worker. Now, one of the issues that we're running into as well with new work permit applications is biometrics. And at this stage, biometrics is not, uh, I'm not aware of um, too many locations uh, in our overseas uh, missions and abroad where uh, biometrics, biometrics are being taken. Um, the off, the, the, um, there, are, there is authority at those embassies and at the consulates to, to waive biometrics in some circumstances, but it's definitely on a case-by-case -case basis. And flipping back, this whole concept of biometrics on the U.S. side, border officers have indicated that if biometrics is possible, um, they will do that, but they do reserve the right to say, we're going to waive it for now or have you come back at a later date, depending on the safety of the officers, the circumstances and those kinds of things. But um, but that's kind of the kind of the framework at this stage for for workers. Biometrics are the most obvious one, as Mark said, but there are a number of other things that may be hard to get as well. In some places, um, you know, it's difficult to get a medical examination if you need one. It may be difficult to get a police clearance if you need one. Uh, sometimes the visa application centers themselves are closed. There are all kinds of other practical barriers, even though you may get you may fit into one of the exemptions in the order of counsel. Exactly. All right. I'm going to just pull up one thing here. I want to show you guys. So Oh, that was the wrong one. This is the one that I should pull up. Okay, so we've got an unknown person who's asking a great question here about parents and um, on visitor visas or PRs exempt from the travel ban if they self-isolate once here, not traveling from the U.S. Okay, so people are asking some awesome questions. And what I'm going to tell you right now is to hold off on those questions and we're going to get to those as we work through it. So the last part will devote to those questions. So hold off on posting them. I'll give you the green light and then you can post them. Okay. Not only that, but we may end up hitting uh, the answers to some of these as we, we go may. through the exam. That's a good point. That's a good point, Kyle. All right. Okay. So let's shift over to students, which huh, is not an easy discussion. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on students because there is a lot of uh, sort of unknowns there. There is this magical cutoff date of March the 18th. Um, so what they've said is if you have a valid study permit, or you were approved for a study permit uh, before, on or before March 18th, then you're exempt from the travel ban. Um, but you're still subject to this overall non-essential travel ban that applies to everybody um, if you're coming from overseas. And so even if you've been approved for a study permit, but they determine that your school's closed or only doing online studies, you could still be refused even if you do have a study permit or have been approved. Um, if you weren't approved, before March 18th, you're unlikely to get approved at this point um, because for the most part, the schools aren't uh, doing in-person uh, uh, instruction. Um, so I, I think we'll have to stay tuned to see uh, what's gonna happen on that. But for now, um, that March 18th deadline is, is, is sort of a cutoff, but in fact, many people who even are exempt because of that are gonna get refused because their schools aren't requiring them to be there in person. Right. Yeah. And one thing we aren't getting into is just the ramifications of that. People who, mm -hmm. um, you know, who are, who are looking to use, you know, the, the time in Canada towards express entry and things like that. Um, we're not going to address that, but I will direct you back to those uh, those two websites that I showed previously from IRCC. And you can get a lot of clarification from those. But we're not going to dive into those that areas. It we'd be we'd be chasing a rabbit for a long time to. to we we could spend that. a whole several yeah. sessions on that. I, I maybe just mention one. Mm -hmm. what, what I think is a pretty important one is that they have made some allowances for eligibility for the post graduation work permit for people who have been forced to do some of their studies outside of Canada online. Yeah. And, and at this point, I think they've said as long as uh, half of the program is done physically in Canada, then you'll be able to qualify for the post-graduation permit. But right. as Mark said, there's a whole yeah. lot more there that yeah. we're not going to get into because we don't yeah. have time. And that's a great point, Kyle. And what Kyle's referring to is, you know, you have to have been able to uh, demonstrate that you've studied for a certain period of time in order to get that post-grad work permit and how long will also have an effect on the length of that post-grad. So if you've got a two-year program and you're really looking for that three-year post-grad, but you've had to take up to a year of those studies outside online because of uh, the, the travel restrictions, then immigration has indicated at this stage that there is some willingness to allow that external or outside of Canada experience to be credited towards the in-Canada schooling. So yeah. yes, and more, there's gonna be a lot more that's gonna be coming. All right, okay, we're gonna, 
flip over now and um, I'm going to put this up here, refugee claimants, just briefly. Um, with the Orders and Council, individuals are eligible to make claims. Um, there are some restrictions and some things that we've kind of, I think many of you have heard about uh, Roxham Road and the many, many um, refugee claimants that have come in through, uh, through that land crossing uh, in Quebec. Um, and uh, the Orders and Council, at least when Kyle and I were reading it, and this is one of the things when we don't practice in the area, you almost, we almost need another window here that we can pull in uh, one of our colleagues who really practices a lot in this area. But um, one of the things that it appears to have happened with these Orders and Council is that um, the ability for people to stream in through Roxham Road has been significantly curtailed. Uh, just because of the travel restrictions. Now, I may get lots of comments where they say, Mark, didn't you know that they made some, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, amendment to this or something like that? But as it stands, the Orders and Council, when we read them, it appears to be that if you are making that claim, you have to do it at a port of entry. And, uh, and obviously, Roxham Road is not at this stage designated as a port of entry. So stay tuned with that. And then the, the reason that's important is because of this thing, which maybe Mark, you've mentioned in the past is the safe third country okay. agreement between Canada and the U S which prevents many people from making claims at a port of entry, which is why people have been trying to cross not at a port of entry at places like rocks and road. So that's why this is a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, all right, so let's flip over to some of the more enjoyable areas here and ones that have really driven a lot of our discussion, and that's the family members of citizens of PRs, workers, and students. So what do you got to say about this one, Kyle? Because I can tell you more questions I have uh, regarding this situation than almost, uh, almost any other. Yeah, the one word answer is maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a, there's a way longer answer to that, and, and there's... I think a lot of this is going to come out as we go through the examples, but really they are sort of doing an individualized assessment um, for uh, for family members of even of Canadian citizens and permanent residents um, based on the purpose of their entry. So um, there are situations in theory where um, family members of Canadian citizens are, are supposed to be exempt from the travel ban but they're still covered by this overall essential purpose part of the order and council. And so even as a family member of a Canadian citizen, if they determine that your purpose is totally discretionary, and you'll see in some of the examples, I mean, the, the most extreme examples are, you know, a Canadian citizen and foreign national spouse live across the border in the U.S. and they want to come in and go shopping for designer clothes. I think that's one of the examples we'll get to. Um, that's clearly discretionary. And so even though this person is the spouse of a Canadian citizen, the purpose for entry is totally discretionary, they're gonna get refused entry. Yeah. And so um, so being exempted from the, the overall travel ban doesn't exempt them from this essential purpose assessment. Um, and then even more so for spouses of foreign nationals who are here for other reasons. So for example, um, spouses and children of foreign workers Again, it'll depend on um, what they're doing here and where their normal residence is, for example. In theory, um, they are supposed to be able to accompany foreign workers who are living here if they're coming to live here with the foreign worker spouse or parent. Uh, but if they're coming in to visit, for example, if the foreign worker's here on their own and they're coming in to visit for a week, that may be discretionary. So it's a fairly individualized assessment, as, as we'll see in the examples. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other weird one is um, the, the family members of applicants for work permits. And there's some stuff in the orders and in the, and in the memo about reunification, which sort of implies that they will admit family in order to join a foreign worker who's already living here. But it's less clear whether the family of a foreign worker who's applying for a work permit can include that family at the time of application. That part's really murky, and the examples don't shed much light on that. Yeah. And, and we've heard anecdotally from our colleagues, I think both ways. We've had, we've had situations um, where workers 
and their families have applied at the same time and they've all been issued visas and got their permits. I think we've heard of other situations where they've said, no, a foreign worker gets your work permit, everybody else has to wait and apply separately to rejoin them under the yeah. reunification exemption. Yeah, and you're, you're right. And one of the things too you'll see as we go through these examples is that they are, they're, they're very polarizing. In other words, they're, <laughs> they cover a broad spectrum, but the fringes and the middle ground is really where we're stuck. And as immigration lawyers, it makes it unbelievably difficult for us to advise our clients because yes. You know, it's bad enough when everybody goes online and hears about their friend who was able to get in with their cousin or whatever it was. And then they come to us and say, well, why can't I come? You know, you're saying that I can't travel. Why well, not someone else who was admitted? And uh, and when we're just not quite sure, uh, it just makes it impossible for us to, to, to really advise with any certainty. So, huh, fun time. Yeah, as, as Mark said, the, the examples are, are the obvious extremes. Um, but the interesting stuff is the nuance in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then the last one that we're going to just touch on is visitors, and this is going to be very short. As you see, this whole concept of is this entry discretionary or not? Um, usually, if you're coming for the per pure purpose of you know of of a holiday, you know to just visit family, visit friends, um, there isn't an essential purpose to what you're doing. Um, then it's just not going to happen. And that doesn't matter if you're coming from the U.S. or if you're coming overseas, that blanket kind of rule applies. And where it's a little bit more gray when we talk about visitors is individuals that are seeking to come in, as Kyle has kind of alluded to, and we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, individuals who may not need a work permit, but they're coming in for work purposes, like our business visitors. And we know that there are mechanisms in place to allow uh, even these types of individuals who are um, outside of the U.S. who need to make that application now, who otherwise they may have been able to do it at a port of entry uh, just through an ETA, such as our after-sale service individuals. Um, there are mechanisms in place when the purpose of that entry is really essential and it goes right to the heart of what they're looking at. And, you know, when we talk about overseas, what are they really prioritizing? They're prioritizing, you know, the fight against COVID-19. They're, you know, they're prioritizing agriculture. They're prioritizing anyone that's involved in healthcare, and those areas, <clears throat> you've got a really, really good shot at, at getting um, approvals to travel in those circumstances. When, as the border, uh, sorry, as the, some of the um, the overseas offices have indicated, where they're in critical areas, which is a term that is not listed anywhere, but yet it's kind of given as an explanation. Well, unless it's critical, you know, you're not getting priority. So. Um, so those are kind of everything that's kind of overlaying and we will jump into the, um, the examples now so you can see what we're talking about. Now, as we get into this um, with the examples, uh, it's such that there's either me or Kyle that our ugly mugs are going to be here beside the image, but we'll, we'll, we'll gradually kind of work our way through it. I'll, uh, I'll jump over first myself here and I just want to point out just a couple things. As we indicated before that this is traditionally restricted to U.S. citizens and other foreign nationals into Canada from the U.S. So that's where this was started from. But the basis of all these examples, there's a lot of explanation, and I will make this available. Um, I'll find a way to either uh, link it somehow in the show notes uh, or in the description of this video. Um, but you can see there's a bunch of information just talking about how what they're looking at for non-optional uh, travel for refugees. They've got everything in here. But what we're going down is we're jumping all the way down here to... This one right here, which is Appendix B. And this Appendix B really drives the ship for us. This is the one where we are, um, uh, where we've got all of our examples. We've got a scenario here on the left. Then we've got whether they determine at the onset whether it should be discretionary or non discretionary. And the interesting part about this is many officers, to a large extent, are looking very carefully at the second column. And if they feel that your situation falls within the scenario listed here or closely to it, there isn't a lot of you know discussion. <laughs> there isn't a lot of opportunity to change their mind. So green is good and red is bad. And so um, so we'll get we'll we'll touch on in these a little bit more. It talks about the rationale. Okay, well some of these are for safety and security purposes uh, or primary residences in Canada. Or the rationale is optional or discretionary. And that tends to be one of the main rationales. And then self-isolation. Well, if you're not admitting you, that doesn't apply. But then they have this column as to whether individuals should self-isolate, which now, for all intents and purposes, to a large extent, um, there are some limited exemptions, which we're not going to get into today. 
uh, but you can make the pitch to be exempt from the isolation requirements. But uh, generally speaking, as Kyle's indicated and we talked about before, uh, that 14 day isolation tends to be um, in place for most people unless you can prove that you're exempt from it. But let's face it, it makes sense why we're doing it, right? So, you know, unless there's a real, real good reason to seek some kind of an exemption, uh, we, we really should try to uh, abide as much as possible. At least that's how I'm advising uh, our clients. Okay, so let's touch on the first couple ones kind of relate to work. And so I'll, I'll tackle these, but then I'll pull Kyle in periodically as well. Um, as we're going through this, you can see the first one that's highlighted here, and I apologize, it's so small. I'll just read it out. For national work or study permit holder whose primary residence is in Canada. And you can see non-discretionary essential, and you can see they use those that terminology um, interchangeably here. So for us, just assume for the purposes of our discussion here, we're not going to get into the legalities of each of these um, and the statutory interpretation, but non-discretionary non is the language that they use. And they allow it because the person meets the OICs uh, and under the, the uh, OICs, both in both cases, if you hold a work permit, you're able to do that. Uh, but it's because of you, you are a primary, your primary residence is in Canada. And what we don't know is if you held a work permit, your primary residence isn't in Canada, to what extent they're going to show flexibility with that. So there's a reason that they describe this as a primary residence in Canada. Any thoughts on that, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that they focused on this primary residence issue because it's not found anywhere in the orders in council. It's not clear where that where that idea came from as a as a critical basis for finding something to be essential. But it does appear in a couple of the different examples that they give. So it's a good one to focus on. Yeah. And if we take it and we just slip down here and look at the one below it for national with secondary residence in Canada. And this includes hunting fishing cabins. So you can see, bang, that's a red one. You're not coming in. And, uh, you know, <laughs> thoughts thoughts on that, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, this falls into the category of uh, obvious extremes. Um, if you're coming in for some, you know, if you're coming in to go to your cabin or uh, to go hunting or fishing, clearly you don't need to be here at this time. Um, that's just Maybe it's so obvious that they didn't need to state it, but I guess they're giving it to show the kinds of things that are supposed to be obvious. Yeah, the ducks, I guess the ducks will wait. The ducks will wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll just zip through these and we'll kind of highlight some that are, that are really uh, major points. Kyle, if you see anything you want to chime in, just jump in. Um, For sure. Obviously, essential workers, nurse, firefighters, of course. Cross-border employment, you know, that live in one country and are working on the other, that's a no-brainer. Um, workers who live in one country and work in, in the other. This is where we run into the challenge. So <laughs> workers who are in one country uh, work in the other. These are our parachuters who are flying in or driving across the border. It depends on the circumstances. And one of the things that they ask, which is common sense, you know, is the business still permitted to operate? This is where, is it an essential service? Are you coming in to manage a restaurant? You know, and obviously these things are starting to, to be opened up and, and, you know, these restrictions on, um, on on gathering in each of the provinces are starting to be opened up a little bit. But this is what was driving the, the situation. If the role mm -hmm. that you're filling is, you know, to, to, to assist with our food supply chain, you know, there's a, probably a good chance that, you know, you're going to be able to, to travel back and forth or you fit into one of those other categories that are, you know. But you can see if business is shuttered due to COVID-19 restrictions, rationale for entry would not satisfy non-discretionary requirement. So, but I, I, I just want to add to this one, Mark, because I think actually looking at this one again, I think this one is a really important illustrative one because um, it's one where it doesn't actually talk about the business providing essential services. It just says, um, good point. If the business is permitted to be open, then travel would be considered non discretionary, period. And so I think that helps inform all of the other worker examples. Mm -hmm. That's that is a really, really good point. All right. Okay. So let's keep sk skimming down here. So traveling to Canada to work under the SOP. So obviously agriculture is a huge thing. And I think we've heard, you know, upwards of maybe 17,000 or some foreign workers to work in these areas. And it's interesting as we see, it was, we saw the restriction in New Brunswick. Um, and I'm just going to go back to our guest view so here. Well. <laughs> we saw that, we saw that those restrictions where they blocked foreign workers in New Brunswick because, you know, the, the they felt, okay, and I'm not going to name names, but an individual felt, 
oh, all these New Brunswick people who um, who are out of work will, will go work uh, picking berries. And uh, they'll fill these positions because there isn't work otherwise. Lo and behold, they didn't want those jobs. They didn't take them. And much to the chagrin and disappointment of this individual, um, this official, uh, they then, you know, obviously op opened it back up. And so it's interesting to see just these perceptions that are that are at play. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's keep zipping down through these a little bit quicker here. Okay. Um, so four nationals who reside in Canada but are waiting for their permanent residency, primary residence of work, uh, of residence or work is in Canada. So oh, I'm, I've got I picked the wrong one here. I got to get on the right one. I'm gonna. I've got a couple different things going on. Okay, so this one here, uh, where and I apologize for how small this is, everyone. So that's kind of why we're reading it. But this one, Kyle, four nationals um, who reside in Canada but are waiting for their PR, their primary residence uh, or or work is in Canada. So I, right. So I I think. Um, we were trying to figure out the situation yeah. that this would actually apply to. And I think um, most likely it's uh, people who have applied for permanent residence, um, for example, as a sponsored spouse in Canada. Um, so um, they, they may not have a work permit. If they already have a work permit and they're living in Canada, they're going to qualify under one of those other examples. Yeah. So the, the fact that they listed this as a separate example, I think, is probably for uh, for people for inland spousal applicants primarily. Yeah. Um, all right. So religious reasons. This is interesting. It's just broad, right? Across the board. Discretionary, optional, non-essential, not admitted. Now they're not, <laughs> they're not prejudicing or or, or um, unfairly, um, you know, targeting religious organizations. The reality is many, as they've indicated here, um, the services are and the ability to actually congregate were were restricted. So it, it just came part and parcel with the the internal restrictions within each province. And if you are coming for religious reasons and, you know, you, you don't have the ability to, you know, to, to, to meet and most organizations, most religious organizations are meeting virtually um, with the provincial limitations. It just it, it'd be pretty hard to show that it was an essential uh, or uh, a non-discretionary uh, purpose. All right. Okay, and then we'll jump down here. So now we have four nationals who transit through Canada to go hunting. Now, I think this is our Alaskan hunters, you know, to a large extent, who are looking to go up to, to go hunting. And, and I'm sorry, that, that isn't going to be, the deer will be protected for another day. Um, yeah. Okay, and then Kyle, I'll have you address this one. Four nationals who own a business which is still open in Canada. Right, so this is a bit strange because it, it in a way it contradicts that one above, um, because in this case it says if the business falls within the designated essential service or functional listening, listing, then travel may be non-discretionary. Um, but then it says non-essential businesses are closed. So that implies that maybe if it's open, then it's non-discretionary. Yeah. Um, the essential there is just determining whether it's likely to be open or not. Um, it, it's a bit of a strange example, but I, that's how I read that. You bet. And then we've got another one that addresses at the bottom students. So students returning to continue studies or begin studies depends on the circumstances. <laughs> How do you advise people on this one? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. But again, um, it, it's going to depend a lot on what the school is doing and whether it's actually uh, operating in person, doing in-person classes, which I think few or none are. Yeah. Um, and Again, it may depend partly on where your normal residence is. If you happen to, uh, if you live in Canada and have lived here for a couple of years as a student and you happen to get caught outside of Canada when the order came down, you might have a good case for getting back in. Um, but in, in many circumstances, you won't. Yes, that's exactly the case. Okay, uh, these are some of the funny examples that we have here. So coming, <laughs> yeah. coming to Canada to go shopping for new designer apparel. Huh, shockingly, <laughs> that's probably going to be considered um, non-essential. Coming to Canada, but if it's not designer oh, apparel. Yeah, good knows? point. Good point. If it's just you know you're just going to Walmart, um, maybe no, maybe not. All right, coming to Canada to go shopping for basic essentials: food, grocery, pharmacy, and you can see it's interesting. Depends on the circumstances. So you know it's considered to be non-discretionary if there are no stores or no stores nearby. So example, Saint. Pamphile in the U.S. that have basic essentials, food, pharmacy, or gas. Um, so, 
you know, it, it just makes sense, right? If this is yeah. survive. And maybe even some better examples would be the ones, the, the U.S. communities that don't have road access to the U.S. at all. Yeah. Um, places like Haines, Alaska and um, um, Point Roberts, BC or Washington and places like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, and then of course, as Kyle has already uh, discussed in detail, Canadian citizens who try to go to the U.S. and are refused, well, of course, they're going to be allowed back into back into Canada by by right. Okay, uh, then we've got nannies traveling with Canadian families, and as I was thinking about this one, I think to a large extent, some of these were created at a time when people were trapped outside, unaware, and uh, and so it makes sense that if you had a nanny on a work permit in Canada, they were abroad with you and your family, your Canadian citizen family, on a holiday. And then, you know, their ability to come back in, uh, obviously they're, they're, you know, and obviously this is from the U.S., so maybe you went down to the U.S. or wherever it was. Um, it depends on the circumstances, but we see those as being, you know, pretty clear examples. But if they're just, uh, you know, if they have no status in Canada, you're a Canadian citizen family living abroad and you just want to come back to Canada, that there may be a different issue if you just want to bring your, your nanny as, as a visitor. Well, how do you say this is a, you know, a permanent kind of move and your nanny's coming permanently if, they have no authorization to to uh, to work in Canada. That's right. Okay. Um, okay, and then at the bottom we've got a, another fun one. This is a tough one. Coming to Canada for dinner with your Canadian spouse. That is just terrible. I can't believe that they would restrict that. Come on, like serious. <laughs> like there's the yeah, finest let's... dining in Canada. <laughs> let's also file this under obvious extremes. Yes. Um, but the but the interesting point there is that. Um, it, that family members of Canadian citizens, even though they're technically exempted from the ban, they're still covered by this overall essential purpose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, and then we've got joining spouse or parent while they're working in an essential job in Canada, work permit. So this is this is one of those ones, right? Um, where, we're, where we're just, you can see depends on the circumstances, which is really, really difficult because we've seen it go a bunch of different directions. Um, you know, Kyle is kind of maybe leaning a little bit on the side of maybe they won't be allowed en entry. Um, I kind of think to myself, well, if it's an essential job, you know, there's probably a good case that you can be made, you know, to be made that we need this person here. And look, they're going to be, you know, you've got a good plan in place. And I think that helps when you're arriving at a, a port of entry. And let's say it's a, a U.S. citizen who's making a work permit application. Um, and, you know, we've, we have the reunification of family thing at play, but I think if you've, you know, at the borders, one of the most important things they're looking at is, do you have a plan in place? You know, do you have a, a real good plan to make sure that you can self-isolate and all those things? And then I think they're going to have a lot more willingness to, uh, you know, to allow entry for this spouse joining someone who's on a work permit, um, compared with someone who really doesn't have a plan and have to try to take a taxi to their home and all those kinds of things. So. The obvious omission, omission here is that they they haven't said what happens for someone who's working in a non-essential job, um, <laughs> yeah. who, who may be entitled to come in as the worker may be entitled to come in from the U.S. because they don't need to show that it's an essential job. Um, but this example even says, says that even if it is an essential job, then it still depends on circumstances. So yeah. open question as to what would happen for a non-essential job. Absolutely. All right, so our time is quickly uh, sailing by here. Let's just dive into some of these family-related issues. So we've talked a little bit about this already. Foreign national coming to Canada to temporarily, and I think that's the word here, temporarily reside with spouse or immediate family during the pandemic. So I've got a good friend, lives here with me here. His wife is in, um, is in Peru, and she comes periodically. She's a professional there. They've been dragging their feet, filing the spousal, so she comes periodically. Um, but now they have been blocked. And so this is one where, yeah, she, she, not only are there local domestic issues with getting flights, but the, the reality is uh, for her to be able to come right now because she is not primarily here and she's just coming temporarily, uh, she's, been, she's been shot down. So uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, Kyle. Well, just, just another example of where they're bringing in this concept of the, the primary residence um, and, and that being a really important determining factor in whether it's essential or not. Yeah. And the bottom ones that we have here, all the same, same idea. Coming to visit mm -hmm. Canadian spouse during their days off. Coming to Canada to visit with Canadian family. Foreign national traveling with their Canadian citizen immediately, immediate family member for a discretionary or, op uh, for a discretionary or optional purpose, which 
it kind of kind of just repeats the whole nature of what we're doing here. It sets the stage for this, you know, the Canadian obviously can come in all they want, but it's their uh, it's their accompanying family member that um, uh, clears day non-essential. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, OK, we've got some shared custody, Kyle. And um, yeah, so that one's a, I think it's an important one um, and it's more and more common. Um, it if the kids need to come across because their custody order requires that they share the time between the two parents and the two parents live in two different countries, that is non-discretionary entry. The, the border officers have to let them in for that purpose in order to comply with the court order yeah. or agreement. Yes. How about birth of a child? Coming to Canada for birth of a child. Uh, this one, I mean, I don't know how many of you saw in the news last week, um, the, the story of a, I think it was a U.S. dad coming for the birth of his own child. Um, the child's mother was in Canada and he was denied entry. And, and there was a, there was, a, I, you know, I actually think that that's the case that resulted in the disclosure of this memo. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, um, Border officers are taking a surprisingly tough line on this and saying that it's not necessarily essential to come for the birth of your own child. Uh, and it may depend on things like whether the hospital allows visitors at all. Yes. Um, yep. So if you can't, if you're not allowed into the hospital to be there for the birth of your child anyway, they're not going to let you into the country yep. in order to stand outside the hospital and not be there for the birth of yep. your child anyway. Yep. So circumstance dependent but it, it, i don't know that one i find a little bit heartbreaking yeah i do and I, and you can take one step down too coming to canada for compassionate visitation imminent death so yeah. dependent on circumstances right i've we've we've had someone um you know close uh, my brother one of his friends uh, you know he was it was a very aggressive cancer and his uh, his daughter was down in the us kind of she had other issues with her immigration status because she was married to american and wasn't that application hadn't been processed yet. It was in the queue. And, and she was, yeah, she was not able to, um, you know, to, uh, as a Canadian citizen, she could, she could come and travel. That wasn't an issue, but uh, her spouse and uh, just the circumstances, th those situations are heartbreaking. And uh, I actually yeah, have a lot tough. of compassion for the officers because they're reading this, right? And then they've got people that they have to answer to. And um, I remember working on the border in two, and this is kind of a little bit of a tangent and our time is drifting away. And Kyle, if you have to drop off, you know, at, uh, at, at um, well, two o'clock mountain time, that's fine. I can kind of answer a little, uh, some of the questions myself, or if you can stay on a little bit longer. Yeah, I can stay for a bit, no worries, thanks. Okay, so, but I remember working on the border in 2002 when the G8 summit was happening in Calgary. And during that time, they were worried about you know, on the border, they were, you know, advising us, don't be that officer that lets in the crazy person that blows everyone up. And so we took a very, very stringent um, view of anyone coming up, you know, the, the, you know, the protester buses that were running on, you know, uh, McDonald's uh, fry oil, uh, those, you know, we turn, you know, we turn those around. And, and, uh, and I think to a large extent, officers also, you know, they don't want to be that person who lets someone in necessarily, that then spreads, you know, the, the virus. And uh, so I think that's what's operating here. And like I said, I've got tremendous compassion for them. I, and, and even even more so for the families that are stuck in these just terrible situations. You Absolutely. know, and, and look at this, coming to Canada for the birth of a grandchild. Sorry, that's not, you know, that's not essential. So yeah, really, really tough. Um, yeah. And the last one, you know, foreign national coming to pick up students on study permits to, to all go back to the US. Well, we just experienced this, you know, my daughter was in Utah, it was in Idaho and my, my wife had to go back and, and pick her up and then return to Canada. And um, obviously, you know, the, the entry to the U.S., they have different rules and things. And this was before all of this kind of, you know, it was before March the 18th. But it makes sense that in these circumstances, you want to bring your, your child home that you're, they're going to, they're going to, you know, generally uh, carve it out. But it's still dependent on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then our last ones here we have, Kyle, traveling with a Canadian for the purposes of visiting Canadian's family. That's a no brainer. Yeah. yeah. No brainer. The Canadian can come in, but the family just can't. Right. And then the last one, the funeral, which. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is another real like pulls out your heartstrings, but um, this one I understand a little bit better because even Canadians for the most part aren't allowed to attend funerals in Canada if they're already here because of the prohibitions on gathering so i mean this is is another real heartbreaker but um but i understand it 
Yeah, exactly. Okay, well now you guys have all been very, very patient and uh, we have, um, we've got a bunch of questions that are all over the map. So we like to focus them on ones related to travel in particular. Uh, but we will be kind to some extent and, and you know, if there are some other ones, I know everybody's gotten used to me coming on here and answering questions about anything. But if we can kind of try to limit them a little bit to just the travel restrictions and entry and those kinds of things. Um, but we'll be we'll be a little generous here. So the first um, <laughs> the first question here uh, we're, we're going to pull up is um, this one is from Kumar and he says, uh, my confirmation of permanent residence is expiring and I'm unable to travel. What should I do? So this is the example of, you know, a, a person who's been approved their permanent residence, but the travel restrictions are are, um, are preventing them to, from, from traveling before it expires. So Kyle, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that one? Oh, that's that's a tough one. And um, I'm trying to bring up the, the guidance on that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they've been experimenting with... Um, electronic landings for people who are in Canada mm -hmm. um, and so they've kind of gone through them in batches depending on on when they were uh, yes. when they were approved yeah. but for um, for applicants who have um, who have their confirmation of permanent residence and, exp and it's expiring um, my understanding is that it's still uh, they're still subject to the travel ban is that your yeah, understanding? They are. and so if it's obviously if it's this this march 18th right <clears throat> so that day you know you're still faced with the same layer on top of everything kumar um with demonstrating that the purpose of your travel is is it's basically non-discretionary but in your situation with an expiring copr and an inability to travel Remember, you, 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 the process you follow is to submit a web form indicating that, hey, I can't travel. And I would provide, you know, whatever explanation you feel is necessary, but to the IRCC web form. And, uh, and, and then they will take a note of it. And if you go back to those, uh, those websites that I showed at the beginning of this video, um, they'll have specific instructions and direction on what to do. But essentially for you, just request, uh, send that web form, notify them that you can't travel and, uh, and that you'll let them know when you can. And then I know personally, I don't think there's going to be any situation where they're not going to reissue the, the confirmation of permanent residence and give you an opportunity to still fulfill your landing. Now, you may have to renew your meds. You may have to redo your, your police certificates. But in those circumstances, they will just kind of file it away. They'll keep you there, even though your COPR may have expired. Um, but you do have an obligation to notify them and to uh, yeah just keep give them a heads up that you can't and you're still interested in coming. It's just your travel. Your your travel is restricted. Okay, that's right. And, and Kumar, there there are a lot of people in this situation, yeah. and and this is very much on uh, the minds of IRCC decision makers. And so, um, while they haven't figured out exactly what they're going to do with people in your situation, they're 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 very actively working on it. And I and as Mark said, I, I think worst case scenario, you may have to renew your medical examinations, things like that. But they're not going to refuse you just because you can't land because they've told you you can't travel. Yeah. Okay, here's a big one. Let's see if we can get this. It's kind of taken up a little bit of our screen. But so basically, uh, this person's received COPR after March 18th. And we are starting to get some of these. So they're planning to travel in August with their Canadian citizen partner, looks like, and son for the person moving and residing here permanently. Given that the PR application was approved after March 18th, will this person be exempt to the travel restriction? Seems like this may fall under non-discretionary purpose. Um, yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the, the rules in terms of travel are that March 18th is a kind of a hard deadline. And so, you know, moving here, Canadian citizen partner, um, you know, I think August, hopefully things will have softened a little bit by then, but you're right. This, this could definitely, um, fall under non, um, well, I, you've said non-discretionary here, but the, the, the reality is I, we're just not sure at this stage how they would treat those. Any thoughts and I would just say if, if. If you're coming from the U.S., then you may fall into that um, that example that they gave of uh, of a Canadian citizen spouse relocating permanently to Canada with a foreign national spouse. Um, you may fall under under that exemption. Yeah, that's possible. From the U.S. All right. Okay. Good question, Mark. Okay. Um... Okay. Let's see what our boss says here. I read it somewhere that Canada has put the travel restrictions until June 30th. 
can we expect to get our passport requests after this particular date? Okay, so Arbaz, you're right. So lots of you are kind of in limbo. Uh, in other words, you've everything's been approved. You know, you're just waiting for it to be finalized. It's been in the queue for a long time. I think that is an important factor. Um, you know, when these travel bans are lifted and people can now move and, and, and travel more freely, I think we're going to start to see a lot more of these issued. Um, but it's still, uh, we're in really uncharted territory when it comes to the processing. We just don't know. Uh, we do know they're continuing to process and approve within Canada, like Kyle had indicated. They're starting to issue email confirmations. So, congratulations, you're a permanent resident. Send us a photo and we'll give you your PR card. But for you outside of Canada, sometimes people, they don't realize you're outside of Canada and you've received those letters and they have told us that you are a permanent resident, but you still have the issue of being able to travel. And in many cases, you need a permanent resident travel document to board a plane to come. But for uh, this situation here, yeah, we just, we're, we're just uncertain. Okay. Um, okay. Here's a tough one. So Visha says, do you think the parent of a PR travel, um, the parent of PR travel on a visitor visa can come to Canada to help with their grandchildren while the PR works. They'd be coming on an international flight and would self isolate for 14 days. What do you think Kyle? Someone who's coming just to, um, so it's a parent of a permanent resident in Canada and they just want the parent to come help watch their child. Yeah, so I think um, I think there was an example on that. Um, it was uh, coming to help with childcare, um, you know, coming to be a caregiver for a Canadian family member, dependent on circumstances. So it'll depend on whether there are alternatives uh, for that care, for example. Um, and and this is you know, this is from the U.S. I think if you're from overseas, I I suspect the airline's not going to let you on the plane. Yeah. It's going to that's my yeah it's going to be tough obviously yeah. there's an element of of like in legal terms a humanitarian and kind of compassionate argument that you make in these circumstances where you say mm -hmm. look i have to work i'm a nurse right i am working in a hospital and um and it's critical for me to be there but i have a young child who is mm -hmm. 10 years old now because the schools are closed they're home and i have no one to care for them so that's you know that's an argument that you can make um, but like I said, there's, there's discretion and it's on a case by case basis. So neither Kyle nor I can say, yes, this is what you do, uh, or, or no. So I, I would maybe just add a little bit about the mechanics here. Um, these decisions for people, for someone who already has a visa, for example, or doesn't need a visa and has an ETA coming from overseas, the decision of whether they can come here, the first decision is actually made by an airline agent. Um, and they may be calling CBSA for guidance, but um, but you've got a couple of hurdles before you ever even get to see a border officer. Um, and the airlines are playing it very cautiously. They get fined big time for allowing people to board who weren't authorized to travel. So they always err on the side of caution. And uh, we've heard of lots of people who probably should have been admitted getting refused by the airlines before they even get on the plane. Yeah. And that's, yeah, you make a good point just because you even, and it, the flip side, we've talked a lot about the ability to get on the plane and then what CBSA is doing to you. But the reality is you have to, you have to get past that first, you know, that first gatekeeper. And with some of the reports that we've seen, the airlines are becoming a lot more gun shy when the consequences of getting it wrong um, are hitting them. You know, they're already decimated, right? By the, the fact that the travel has just been killed. So all right. Okay. This is a good one, Kyle. This one's for you. Okay. This is from Starbucks girl and it says NHL travel outlook. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I was listening today, Starbucks girl, and um, I'm sure hoping that the season's going to, is going to, going to continue, but I can't say yeah. in terms of how freely these, uh, the hockey players are going to be able to travel back and forth. <laughs> I, I just I just caught a headline this morning um, about people complaining about special allowances for the NHL when the rest of us had to, <laughs> yeah. had to stay home. So especially especially the testing, that. yeah, the testing yeah, that they were that they were, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is hilarious. So, and then and then this next question, which is awesome, it's awesome too. We are on the NHL theme. Honestly, should just wait until next season. No, you're wrong. They should not. <laughs> I want this playoff format to happen. And if they're all in one location, I can't wait that long for, for hockey. So there's lots we, of people. We know where Mark's loyalties are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go Flames. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll just try to keep a couple more on track here. Uh, okay. Let's see what we've got here. So Sissy says, yesterday... 
I got my inland PR application approved. Hey, that's awesome. Congratulations. Fantastic. No passport request. Confirmation of permanent resident email sent yet. Should I email the RC to follow up? My visa office is Etobicoke. No, sissy. Do not. There's no purpose emailing to follow up. When they get around to it, they will send that email out to you. I've had clients that have been in that situation who are kind of pending, waiting. And so I, you know, you've indicated that you've got it approved here. And I'm not sure if you've, you know, how you knew that. <laughs> you know, uh, obviously the email, um, you know, when it comes to to the actual official approval letter will come to you if you're in Canada. But congratulations, Sissy. That's awesome. Um, I don't know. Yeah, they're, do uh, yeah. They're, they're doing these in batches. Yeah. Um, and so if they haven't got to you, they're, you're probably going to be in the next batch. Okay. This one's drifting off a little bit from our topic, but it's kind of an express entry related one. Self-employed web developer, but my clients don't have any letterhead. What should I do? Get a stat deck, my friend. Get whatever you can to show that they're actually, um, you know, so basically this is a proof of work experience situation and they're trying to prove their self-employed work experience. So in your situation, you, you, you get whatever the next best thing is. If you can get a stat deck, some sworn statement from them, uh, any proof invoices. of your, uh, yeah, any proof of your invoices, the, the bills that you've sent out, the money that's been paid, all of those kinds of things. All right. Um, Okay, let's see. I'm trying. I know people have been so patient here, so I don't want to just exclude people that are asking more random questions. Um, okay, let's go to uh, Litsa here. She says, hello, my husband is a PR in Quebec. I have a valid ETA. I want to live permanently with him. If I declare my intention to apply for PR, will I be granted entry? <laughs> I'm assuming Litsa is a foreign national who's looking to be uh, reunited with her husband in Quebec, which would require a permanent resident application. Um, the, you know, the ability we've seen for people to just get on a plane and come, you've got an ETA, obviously the restrictions now are not going to let you to come. Like the, you're not going to be boarded, um, to, to come in my mind. Um, you're in, in many respects, you're just like my friend, uh, here in, in Lethbridge Curtis with his wife in Peru. And you're just going to have to wait, unfortunately, till things, um, you know, the travel restrictions are, are, are lifted or, or softened. Any thoughts on that, Kyle? Well, I, I think there may be some circumstances, particularly, you know, if if your Canadian spouse were coming in with you, well, I guess your husband is a PR, so probably yeah. not. Yeah, I, I think Mark's probably right there. There there may be some situations where you could make the case, but it sounds like a, a tough one to me. Yeah, and the reality is, like, the airlines, they're, they're going to be one they issue, and... Safe. We don't know really where you're coming from, Litsa, but I'm assuming with an ETA, obviously you're probably outside of the U.S. So, yeah, it's going to be really, 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 really difficult. <laughs> no hockey. Hopefully there will be hockey, Starbucks. Okay. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll have to do another session just on that. I think so. It, definitely enough to talk about. Okay. Sedan says, hey, Mark, I'm on a work permit, not PR and citizen since August 2019. My wife is in India having a TRV. Can she travel? I think the answer is, so, yeah, I, this is this is one that uh, uh, you haven't told us. Theory, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you, she would be able to travel under that exemption for foreign nationals reuniting with a temporary foreign worker who's in Canada. But practically speaking, they're going to they're going to assess this pretty uh, intensely to see if she really needs to be there if she's, you know, if she's coming to live with you permanently and there are circumstances as why why she couldn't come earlier, things like that. Um, I, I think it'll be pretty case specific, even though in theory she fits that exemption. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can't shake the NHL one, Kyle. It still keeps coming oh, back no. here. Well, I mean, come on. You're essentially asking two thirds of the teams to start traveling all over the place and staying in hotels each night. Sounds like a terrible idea to me. No, they're not being asked to travel all over the place. They're, they're, and yes, they might be in a hotel, but you ask how many hockey players want to keep twiddling their thumbs or they want to get back in, into playing. And I think we'll let them make that decision. From a selfish uh, fan standpoint, I'd love to see hockey again. You bring up some valid points there, but we'll let the NHL kind of topic drift off into the sunset. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So Mattel's got a permanent res, a confirmation of permanent res before March 18th. They want to travel from the UAE. Can it be considered as non-essential or essential? Please reply, sir. So this is this is March. This is pre-March 18th. So yes, the short answer yeah. is yes, you can. Um, you have the ability to board the plane. 
but then it comes down to the officers um, that you're, you know, that you're um, establishing that you are traveling for a non-discretionary purpose. And what, what are they looking for? Do you have a place you're going to live? Like, do you have a job? Do you have a plan in place to um, to follow the isolation requirements? You know, where you can, you know, do, really, th those are the factors to a large extent that they're looking at. And um, and so, yeah, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add to that, Kyle. There's just a lot of uncertainty with this. Immigration yeah. says, yes, mm -hmm. you can board. Border officers mm -hmm. say, eh. I, I think you're right. I mean, really, you, you should be able to travel. Um, and we haven't talked too much about that self-isolation plan. I know maybe that's a, an issue for another day. Yeah. But these really have to be well thought out and detailed. Um, an officer wants to know that you have thought about everything. How are you know, where are you going to stay? How are you going to get there? Who else is going to be there? How are you going to get food and other emergency supplies while you're there? Is there a safe way for you to get there without interacting with other people, without stopping for groceries, without stopping for gas? Do you have to take public transit to get there? All those sorts of things are going to be part of that plan and you're going to get grilled on. And if you don't have a satisfactory plan, then it doesn't matter what other authorizations you have to travel. They can refuse you just on that basis. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's get a YouTuber here. We'll get Pulk it in. Hi, Mark. My wife is on a study permit in Canada, and I have applied for an open work permit with medical and biometric already done. When can I expect to travel through the open work permit or any other way? This is, yeah. Okay, this is a classic example once again. We've got lots of foreign workers who are sitting in limbo right now in overseas visa offices. Um, that, why? Well, the offices have been decimated in terms of staffing. So they're operating on skeleton crews. And so they're also prioritizing. And this is where we kind of hinted a little bit earlier on this notion, well, is it critical? And so I've got individuals that are, um, you know, engineers, architects that are looking to come to Canada um, that are, are pending because it can't be demonstrated that the purpose of their travels is essential. And uh, I don't know, Kyle, in terms of your thoughts, we're just in limbo period right now. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and it all comes back to this essential question. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, look at this. We, we, we'll put this one up here. Visha says, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see here now. Some of these are starting to... Um, okay. I think this is maybe a new one. It's kind of the similar vein. I have a spousal uh, open work permit. My husband is on a work permit. Am I eligible to travel or do we need to wait till June 30th? Hmm. I think she's referring to the expiry of the order in council. Um, mm. I have a spousal open work permit. My husband is on a work permit. So maybe maybe she's outside and he's in Canada. I can't quite tell mm. from that one. But like we've talked about before, uh, there's a lot of, yeah, there is no direct answer to this one. Um, we get a lot of sense that if, if it wasn't, if Canada wasn't the primary destination, you know, wow. that even even your situation with an open work permit if you don't have a job offer and everything lined up even if you're reuniting with your your spouse that's on an open uh, your spouse is on a work permit in canada um it's it's questionable it sucks yeah, I think because the, we don't have answers yeah I, I think the ideal scenario there would be if um you've been living in canada already that's your main place of residence you actually have a job already that you need to go back to um, and you're going to reunite with your spouse who has a, has a open has a work permit or a study permit. That would be a situation where I think you you have a good case for travel um, and sort of work back from that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Amna is asking a question about processing. So um, I sponsored my my husband. They received the file December third, two thousand nineteen, mm -hmm. and uh, now the latest status is that it's at London Processing Center. Yes. Okay. So Amna is in Toronto. Yes, all of these. Understand processing times, whatever's posted on the websites, we can pretty much expect that all of those are going to be just thrown right out the window for the time being. Um, just filed December the 2nd. Wow. You know, uh, it seems like it's, you know, that was just yesterday, December. We're already almost into into June here. But the reality is you're, you're likely not going to see a lot of movement on this for, for some time, just given the the realities of the foreign visa offices and the short the short staff just the the challenges that they're experiencing i don't know if you have any other insight on that one kyle no i, I think you're spot on there okay here's one from rock okay rock this is a tough one am i essential i'm a dad of two months old newborn my wife doesn't have a car 
I'm the one providing transportation. They need me in the U.S. Well, the U.S. let me in. Oh, okay, Rock. That's one that's outside of our area of expertise. I, I, I don't know if we, Kyle, you want to venture a response to that. Well, yeah, not not really. I guess I would say that you know that this um, the the U.S. Travel Order and Council um, is part of an agreement between Canada and the U.S. Yep. And so the U.S. has sort of mirroring provisions, but the way they interpret them is up to their border services and maybe quite different from how yeah. uh, the CBSA interprets them. So I wouldn't rely on uh, on that. And, and I definitely wouldn't rely on anything that, that I or Mark tells you. No, no, we are definitely not U.S. immigration experts. OK, um, OK, let's see if we can get one. Um, OK, here's a good one. Huma says the oath will the when will the oath taking ceremony start again? Um, I know that that obviously I think it'll start when they start to open things up for public gatherings. And, uh, you know, I don't know, Kyle, if there's been any recent, um, you know, uh, recent notice. There's been some discussion of doing um, doing virtual oath ceremonies. I don't know if any of those have actually happened yet. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the situation. We're just in this transition period where they're looking ahead. They're trying to see, you know, how long are we actually going to be locked down? And should we let the citizenship ceremonies and the people who are ready to become citizens just continue to queue and build up and build up. And that's always the dance that they're undertaking is trying to figure out, do we create some, well, unique ways of doing it? We know we live in a virtual world, so they could do anything they wanted to. But, you know, in these circumstances, do they uh, do they want to take that step? And right now, I think it's in, in discussions, but no in-person ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, Oh, OK. Sissy so just clarifying that she received an email stating that there's an update on her online account and it stated the final decision approved. OK, there you go, Sissy. So hang tight for your for your email. OK. Um, OK, this is an unknown person. I have an I-94 expiring on the 15th of June. How can I return? Well, unknown, we know nothing about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it makes it pretty hard to say when. Um, and I understand so your position. <laughs> yeah, obviously you're not a Canadian citizen. I'm assuming if you're a Canadian citizen, you just come. Uh, if you're a permanent resident, you just come. So uh, I'm just wondering in terms of when you say, how can I return? Um, you know, what is your status and, and what do you have? Like, do you have a corresponding work permit in, in Canada probably? Um, yeah, so in those circumstances, yeah, we need a little bit more information. I don't know if you want to venture a guess any, any on that, Kyle. No, I agree. I think there, there are a lot, of, a lot more questions than answers there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and also maybe getting a little case specific. Yeah, I think so. Sedan says thanks there. Um, okay. And Igor's laughing. This is so Canadian hockey, hockey, COVID-19. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, flip. Mark, I might have to jump off in just a couple of minutes. Sounds good. We'll, okay. We'll go, we'll do a couple more questions and then we'll, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap this up here. Um, Let's see. Okay. Okay. Here's one. Uh, it's a similar kind of vein. COPR issued on March the 30th and a job offer at my uncle's company in Canada. No LMIA. He just offered me to start as soon as I have my PR card. Does this count as essential? <laughs> uh, so. I'm sorry. What, what date was the June, was it issued? March the 30th, which basically um, is, is beyond that date. So right now, um, I, uh, yeah. I probably not. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no. Okay, we'll end right here. Amna says you guys are just amazing. Great work, you guys. Thank you for what you're doing. All right. Well, this one was a, a little bit of an interesting experience for us. We had to, uh, you know, this to a large extent, it's kind of a trial and error. And so I think it went pretty well. Not too bad. You know, obviously for some of you who are used to me just jumping on and answering questions, you're like, seriously, just get to the uh, get to the get to the question section. But on Thursday, we'll jump back on and I'll be here to answer more of your live questions and in a much more kind of rough and tumble way. But I want to extend a huge, massive thank you to Kyle, who uh, who took some time to come and share his knowledge and experience. I think the world of Kyle, he's an awesome immigration lawyer out in Vancouver and uh, and one of the leaders in our in our field here in Canada. And so it's been a real treat for me to have him join me. So thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you, Mark. It's been really fun. And, and honestly, your your podcast and, and your webinars are amazing. 
Um, and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining in and for your really great and thoughtful questions. Uh, it's been really fun, thank you. Awesome. All right, Kyle, well, we'll uh, I'll sign off here, but I'll, I'll thank you for joining us and, uh, and take care, we'll connect soon. Sounds great, thanks, Mark. Excellent. All right, well, it was great to have Kyle join and um, super happy to have him uh, be a part of this. Obviously, like I said, this had a little bit more meat to it than uh, one of our normal Q and A's, but really this wasn't. This was looking specifically at that um, the the bulletin from the CBSA. And just to you know to end off here, I want to remind everyone that you know Kyle and I have had an opportunity to to work on the other side as well. So we appreciate the situation they're in. And you can imagine whoever created this, they put a lot of thought and work into it. And these bulletins themselves, as I flip back to the bulletin here and we look at all these examples, you can imagine like these probably developed from real life situations and uh, people, officers not knowing what to do. And then they pooled these situations together and then created at least guidance for them. And when you have officers that are faced with, um, you know, just a real, real challenging situation of making decisions on very difficult circumstances, you can appreciate how much they rely on this. And uh, if you have to say no to someone who's traveled, you know, for 20 hours from across the other side of the world to, you know, to, to come and, and live with their Canadian spouse and the officer, you know, isn't sure how to treat this because let's say they're coming from Italy or somewhere like that where it's really um, uh, a really, really a challenging, um, you know, situation in those countries. Um, that's where we, we uh, yeah, that's where we're kind of in a situation where I, I have compassion for the border officers for the simple reason that, wow, they're like they're the gatekeepers. So uh, I will give a shout out to them. And I think this has really been helpful to get people up to speed with what the officers are looking at when they're trying to determine whether or not someone is actually going to uh, be, be admitted. And yeah, there's so many levels. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, for tuning in. Remember Tuesday, uh, sorry, it's Tuesdays today, Thursday at one, we'll do another um, we'll do another live Q&A. And so those who did not get a chance to have their questions answered today, come back then and we will definitely give you an opportunity to, to listen in. So thanks so much. And I wish you guys all the best as you're staying safe and well and navigating this crazy world that we call, well, COVID-19, I guess is what we call it. All right, guys, thanks.